The one interesting question is why we are doing this work. So, like, for example, Coralie, with your rock samples, why is it important to figure out, to find these crusty rocks? What are you gaining from this knowledge? Yeah, I mean, to get to the heart of that question, you really have to wonder why does anyone do anything, you know? Deeply kidding, philosophical. Just kidding. <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> um, I was, uh, I'm a grad student and I was brought on to a funded project that was looking at ferromanganese crust. And um, so I am continuing that work. Uh, so I already was, had been looking at samples from Nautilus before to previous Nautilus cruises um, at a lower latitude in the Pacific and like near and a little bit north of the equator. And then um, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do for the rest of my PhD and was writing the GRFP and came up with this project with the help of my advisor. And I decided that I wanted to actually do it. Um, and so that's what I'm working on now. Uh, but filming in these crusts are pretty cool for a different re bunch of different reasons, one of which is being that they take so long to form. So they could be a good record of past paleoceanographic regimes. Um, you can use proxies um, to figure stuff like that out. And then another cool thing about them is they're super enriched in economically valuable metals and rare earth elements. So when we are thinking about moving towards greener technologies, uh, we need lithium ion batteries, and a lot of, like one big thing that you need in lithium ion batteries is cobalt. Cobalt is extremely enriched in these rocks. And I found so far that my rocks are super enriched in them. Um, so that's been pretty cool. It definitely occupied the higher end of cobalt enrichment that we see for average press. So I'm excited to look at this new province. The oxygen is higher than what it has been at other study locations. So probably going to be less amount of cobalt. But uh, yeah, just excited to test hypotheses, get some more information. You know, we just kind of found out about these rocks, you know, in the 70s and kind of by accident. And so, you know, any new information we can get is going to be useful. Very cool. question at what depth do you see your favorite watercolors i think it depends on where we're diving from like some some ocean some parts of the pacific are very green so that changes the whole scale of things it usually always looks this color to me once you get below a certain depth yeah just about Navigations, do you have a, a time for a mapping question? Hold that one for later. Um, we've got a question about what is the most challenging part of these expeditions that 
There are so many roles on the ship that I think it depends on who you ask. Everybody has a different job and uh, different challenges that come with that job. Well, Willie. like we are about halfway there according to the depthometer. That's good news. Someone in the chat wants to know if we get a lot of coffee during our shifts. I am not a coffee drinker, so I have some tea, but actually I find that at sea, caffeine affects me a little differently. I don't know, it might just be me, but I've, I don't find myself having much caffeine generally, just kind of wanting to get as much uh, sleep time as I can. I drink chocolate milk before each watch. <laughs> nice. Very classy. That in, chocolate milk is so good. In spill-proof containers due to electronics. Yes, we all have spill-proof containers when we are around the equipment.
are we going to see the bottom or is it going to be a handoff at the bottom? <laughs> I was just told that we would probably see, I, I would probably get to see the bottom. I don't know if that's true or not. We'll see. Trevor just said. Yeah, I think we'll hour. have approximately an hour. Nice. Maybe slightly shy of an hour. That includes the time we're going to be used, that's going to be used to set up our cameras and et cetera, et cetera. It's important. That's a rock. And it's a 24 Oops. hour dive, so we won't be on blue water up. Fingers crossed. Don't you jinx it now. Yeah, it's a 24 I've done enough jinxing hour. today. <laughs> Navigations, Aaron, do you have time for a mapping question? Uh, sure, yeah. So the map is not on screen at the moment, but someone was wondering what the timestamps were for. Um, and I, I think they must be talking about high pack. Um, I'm guessing because that's usually what's going out. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so when we, uh, when I drop a target, the initial name of that target is the timestamp of when you drop the target. So usually, um, in our circumstances, that timestamp just means that we didn't, um, I didn't go rename the target anything because I was just marking a location temporarily. Uh, we kind of use targets. We use targets to uh, mark samples and things of interest, but I was also kind of using it to track what the ship was doing this morning um, as far as holding position and getting into position. So yeah, that's just like the, the default name on high pack um, until we go rename it, but then that information is stored in the target as well. So it's quite helpful. If we need to backtrack when something happened, we can see uh, the timestamp of that and like kind of, you know, go back in time and figure out what, what was happening. If you look on channel three, I put it on there. People can see what cool. you're talking about. Yeah, so high packs out on channel three. Um, so we we're just uh, we're testing the ship, trying to step in a couple directions now with the the forces that we're experiencing, and just uh, I'm using the targets to know when we when we completed a move and when we started a move to to make sure that we're we're doing okay as we prepare for this dive. Always happy when someone has a mapping question. Oh my gosh, me too. <laughs> so excited. And I'm trying, I'm making, uh, putting stuff in the flater mouse scene from our mapping last night. So if I get that done, we could look at that. But maybe before we get to the bottom, we'll see. Nice. This is a question for the bridge, technically, but I can answer it. Um, we are not, uh, we did, did not drop an anchor. We do not have a, uh, a 4,000 meter long uh, anchor that we are using to keep the ship in place. The engines are running. Um, so they basically are, they're holding station. So, you know, if the current is going, you know, five, so and, oh, go ahead. We actually, the main engines are off. Um, when we are on a dive, they go use the dynamic positioning system to hold position. So that's the... Um, the bow thruster and the jet pump um, are then used to hold us on station. Um, so when you hold station, you're in the same place, but if we zoom in really closely on the ship, you'll see it's a bunch of tiny little movements to keep the ship at that same geographic location. That's why the, the on the map, the ship makes tiny little squiggles in the line that they're holding. Cause it's just right, yeah. Around. And we just make sure those squiggles say tiny and don't, yes. don't turn into an extended drift. You ever played that game where you try to balance a meter stick, uh, yardstick on your fingers? Like you try to you know, hold it up vertically? You never hold it perfectly. It always tips a little bit, and then you correct. Then it tips a little bit, and you correct the other way. That's the same as the ship holding position. Is this a normal game for Canadian children? Yeah, well, we play with, we do it with a meter stick. <laughs> you don't ever do that? Like where you balance the, or balance a broomstick or something? No. <laughs> oh, I'm surprised. I've seen illustrated plates of children doing that in, you know, like the 1700s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, what can I say? Canada's just a little different. It's okay. <laughs> I grew up doing that. I don't know. Yeah, 
oh wait, why doesn't everyone tell us like where they came from and where they call home base? I feel like everyone I've talked to on this watch has moved around. Some people have multiple homes. Why don't you start, Coralie? Okay, I'm from Oakland. Um, I consider that my home, but I live in Rhode Island. <laughs> This is Megan Petza. I actually live in Hawaii on Oahu, but uh, I'm originally from Chicago. One of the commenters said that uh, they have played Trevor's games and says it must be a guy thing. I don't know about that. No, my sister definitely played it too. Yeah, see, there it's you go. It's a family thing. Um, I'm Avery and Carrington. I am from Washington State. That is where I call home. Uh. Uh, Aaron Heffron, Navigator. I am from Minersville, Pennsylvania. It's a very small town, but I've lived in Portsmouth, New Hampshire for about 15 or so years now. I'm Trevor. I live on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada. Antonella from Los Angeles, California. I live on a ship right now. <laughs> uh, Aaron Rainey video engineer. I based out of Alaska, part of the year, Washington State, the other part of the year, and then I'm slowly moving part of the year to the Falkland Islands, so a, a bit all over. The chat is chiming in that uh, several Canadians balance the meter stick as well as Aussies, <laughs> so maybe it's non-American English, English-speaking Maybe countries. Commonwealth? <laughs> I really can't judge your, your games you played because I played some weird games when I was a kid. Were you the one that was telling me how you grew up playing with tires? Oh, no. Is that someone else? That must have been someone else. We played with buoys, but we'd like hang them from trees and swing on them and then try to jump over the blackberry bushes underneath them. That's high consequence. <laughs> you ever land on the blackberries? Yes. Nice. <laughs> My brother gave me some bad advice. Just in case anybody is taking life tips from this ch from this uh, channel, don't don't play with tires. <laughs> Very toxic and dangerous. Oh, tires? No tires way. Tires are fun. Uh, tires are fine. My dog loves a tire. Um. Oh, tires! I thought you said tigers. <laughs> oh, tires! Tigers like, are. Who played with tires as a child? <laughs> uh, I mean, somebody from awesome you know. childhood. <laughs> I don't know if I'd call tigers toxic, but I would call them dangerous. Not the tiger king, the tiger prince. Or I wonder that actually could have been that. So I wonder if we started that. We could have gone the uh, one nine five without this move. Uh, just hopefully it's okay and it wasn't drift. I wasn't paying enough attention. Uh, anyway. Let's do another 50 meters, 166, unless I don't think we have to worry about any other. Okay. Bridge enough. Can we get a 50 meter step bearing 165? Thank you. Yeah, we want to make sure and hit that arbitrary point for sure.
Yeah, one of the commenters said that they were surprised that we were all kind of within the same within the same uh, continent. Uh, the the crew, the whole crew, is fairly international. We just happen to be a collection of people that are not not as uh, far spread. Yeah, and the ship is international. It's a foreign flagged vessel. There have definitely been people in the science team coming from all over the world. Yeah, the signs on the bathroom are in all different languages. Yeah. And the washing machines. Oh. I get to try my hand at that this weekend. It's going to be I exciting. Always, I always feel so successful when I do my laundry on the boat. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. What, did you see that? It's like the door opened. I didn't even have to get out power tools. I didn't have. <laughs> I didn't have to ask Marlene for help today. Yeah. I'm all about the sports thirty. Sports oh, thirty. Yeah. Sports it's thirty is where it's at. Sports thirty, cold water. Yeah. But if I don't get the one washing machine on the far right, I'm in trouble. I'm well, like, I only go for the left two. I guess the starboard two. If I Still if I'm feeling backwards. extravagant, I do the eco. Mm. That's two hours though. Like, you got to be prepared and you got to remember. <laughs> but that's like nobody's on the ship i'm gonna clean my clothes that's Jess a total mapping cruise move yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally <laughs> otherwise say, you'll get thrown overboard jess and i have been tag teaming since we're on different watches yeah so we're like you 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 take the wash i'll take the dry <laughs> are you guys using one laundry yep nice oh laundry buddies Question for old school Nautilus crew. Does the ship ever travel in the Southern Hemisphere? Yeah, I've been on this ship in the Southern Hemisphere. It was in Samoa. That's right. We did an equator crossing. Yeah. That was fun. And I, I, we have plans to do again, yeah? We'll be down. I think so. Yeah. yeah, we'll be down south. I hesitate to call them plans. <laughs> Aspirations? Yeah. It's good to have dreams. What's this thing? Just as a refresher, we're about halfway through our watch. Um, this is the second dive of the Lu'ua Ea Hiki Ke Kualono Kai Expedition. We are diving to approximately 3,656 meters to explore a flank of Seamount G. It's an unnamed seamount. Make anyone want to chat about what we are looking for today? All right, so uh, we are on the lookout for some, some amazing rocks. We are going to enjoy the geology today, uh, and then we're going to also enjoy some biology viewing. We should be seeing some uh, deep-sea corals and sponges, along with associate animals like echinoderms. And th those include feather stars, brittle stars, um, sea stars. We might see some neat fish, cuskeels, rat tails, and uh, and then we're also going to keep our eyes out for anything new and unusual as we make our way uh, from the deeper depths of the seamount. Uh, we're going to be landing on bottom approximately 3,650 meters and making our way to the summit.
It's everyone's favorite ice cream flavor. Did you ask me? Have anyone. Oh, anyone. Everyone. Everyone. Uh, tiger, tiger. What? That's not a thing. What do you mean? He made it up. It's the licorice one, the orange and... Ew, you licorice. like licorice yeah. ice cream? That's orange. your favorite? Orange you and black licorice. Orange? <laughs> it looks like a tiger. Any? Oh my god. Wait, hang on, hang on. So, is the orange licorice actually orange flavored licorice? No, the black part's the... Is licorice. licorice, and then the orange is orange flavored. Orange flavored. That's orange, your... the color, not the fruit. I don't know if it's flavored like the fruit. It's flavored like the color. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. No, I'm no. not sure I do. <laughs> like you know when you get orange, like uh. That like orange a, juice like we had. Orange. Orange. Orange candy. Orange it's, crusher yeah, or whatever. Yeah, it's like, like not. Or orange. Yeah, exactly. Okay. It's not flavored like the fruit orange. It's flavored like the color orange. Like artificial <laughs> orange. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's Tiger Tiger. <laughs> and where would I see that? Where would I purchase that? I don't know. Any ice cream shop? It must be a Canadian thing. Yeah. I don't know. I think it is. Tiger t Oh, my gosh. You guys, you, oh don't, you don't know how to live. <laughs> don't balance sticks. Yeah, don't have awesome. black licorice orange ice cream. That was all of my summers as a kid. Just eating Tiger Tiger and balancing meter sticks. <laughs> <laughs> Is tiger tail ice cream. Tiger tail. I've oh, sorry. It's tiger 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 tail ice cream is a recipe that you can use to make a uh, like a knockoff version. Ah, uh, knockoff. Hmm. I guess I guess some people say tiger tail. Some people say tiger tiger. I'm learning. Okay. Yes, a beloved ice cream flavor in Canada. There you go. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Consider it beloved. Have you ever tried licorice uh, toothpaste? No. No. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like licorice, but... I want my toothpaste like to taste like licorice, I've rinsed my mouth out flash. and can't taste it anymore. That's yeah. what I want it to taste like. That's, that's, a, that's a solid goal. <laughs> <laughs> also, who decided that mint is like the clean, fresh flavor of like teeth? You know, why isn't it like bubble gum or something? Ew. <laughs> but like, we're trained flavor. to believe that. What if we all believe like licorice was like the no. clean, fresh flavor? <laughs> I think some people do. Back in the day, I feel like licorice was used as like medicinally kind of like cleansing stuff. I could believe that. I don't eat ice cream, but when I did, um, I actually really liked vanilla, like vanilla or vanilla bean, like the fancy vanilla. Wait, mm. why don't you eat ice cream? Are you vegan? Uh, dairy issues. Oh, oh no. Okay. I did uh, make some banana ice cream, though, and then realized I don't understand how people eat ice cream all the time. Like, it's still in my freezer from, like, a year ago. <laughs> I've eaten, like, half of it. Wow. It's, like, one banana's worth. One banana's worth? <laughs> it's, yeah, it, it was sad. <clears throat> How about you, Coralie? You asked the question. Hmm. Well, since I'm a geologist, I have to say Rocky Road, right? Yes, you are contractually ob obligated, yes. Contractually <laughs> obligated. Yeah. Uh, my actual favorite is mint chocolate chip. I'm really basic like that. However, I really like mint, like the actual flavor of mint, not like the, you know, whatever. Tic -tac. Like Yeah, the, like the Tic Tac flavor. Like, I want to actually taste... The mint. I want to feel like I'm eating a mint leaf. There was a mint plant growing on board here for a while. Really? Oh, it was a really nice one, yeah. It was really good. It was Aww. incredible. Yeah. Where'd it go? It uh, is living in Bob's yard now. Oh. Where does he live? He must live in Rhode Island. He lives, no, sorry, different Bob. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, another <laughs> a different Bob. He lives in, the other Bob lives in Los Angeles. Oh. Um, just FYI, it might be significantly less than that, so Duh. keep our eyes open. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Roger. That's, uh, it was just it, based on different data sets, different resolutions, so it was hard to like, nail the number down. What do you think? Uh, closer to like, well, maybe not hugely different, maybe like closer to 3,600 than... Yeah. 
I do appreciate the precision of 3656 <laughs> plus minus 50. I never know like how much I should, at least I don't put the decimal point, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> point <maybe>. two. <laughs> a friend of mine asked me where we were in the world, so I sent a copy paste of the Latin long, yeah. which has like 14 decimal places. Oh, I know. And then like people will give you nonsense about it. It's like, I just copy pasted. I know that's not the precision of where we are. Like Subatomic. Yeah, like I just didn't have time to Getting into quantum. Reduce it quantum locations here there's a significant probability that i'll be here okay do you guys want to humor me and look at data <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah more than anything aaron can you make it happen yeah let's look at some data, let's look at data. data. all right i'm on mb proc yeah give me two seconds okay Oh, sorry. Okay, so you want it on MB? Okay, so that'll be on SAT 3. Um, so people watching look at the quad, and it's your bottom left hand screen. And that is what Aaron will be talking about. Cool. All right, so this was Seamount C, and that was our dive yesterday. Um, obviously, we started up there at the surface, we went down low, followed this ridge up. Played around on the ridge a little bit, and then came back up. Uh, then we had just enough time to map this ridiculous gap that was left here. Is it mapped now? It is mapped. Stand by. Standing. It's really mapped, I swear. Let me Still turn standing. <laughs> I promise. There we go. Let me turn off the other GMRT. All right, so we mapped it. Nice. So nice. it's not really pretty to look at there because it's just a bunch of layers on top of each other, but we went... Came up there, covered that gap. I'm gonna turn off. All right, that's the mapping we did yesterday. Hooray, the amount all full. Then we went as fast as we could south. Um, covered another little gap in data there. The state is not processed, so there's spikes in it, but that'll be cleaned up. But then significantly, this was an important gap. So this is where we're going to be diving in the future, hopefully, um, on this saddle between Seamounts, I believe it's E and F. So they actually want to dive in here. And there is a lot of coverage, but we were missing kind of that vital gap. So we got one oh, line of data there, nice. filled that. And eventually, this will be one nice continuous map that's not 100 different colors. Um, Got that in one pass, left a little bit of a gap there, but got the important part. And then we hauled down here to our current dive site. So we are on Seamount G, um, just this one here. Turn off Northwest Hawaiian Islands. The black lines are 100 meter contours. We are starting at the bottom, not at the bottom, at the deepest depth we can with our depth limitations. Um, coming up on this little bump, continuing our way up to the summit, um, hitting the summit, and then going to have a little bit of downhill action if we don't run out of time to hit kind of the other peak of the summit. And this data just looks really messy here because it's multiple data sets that we're kind of compiling together to show us... Uh, what's available. We didn't want to spend a lot of time mapping it. There is existing data. So this was a transit we did um, on our way out to the last expedition. We covered that portion of the seamount. Um, we have data from NOAA's NCEI database that we downloaded um, that covers the other part of that seamount. And then, of course, uh, University of Hawaii has a, a really nice synthesis of all the regional data. And that's John Smith and all you guys back there, Megan. Um, who did the Hawaii synthesis, and that gives us a couple additional lines that weren't available in NCEI necessarily. So we have a mixed coverage over the seamount, but enough to enough to plan a dive. Um, the summit was kind of questionable. There was a few different depths depending on what data set I looked at. So if we have time at the end of this dive, we're going to try and get a multi-beam pass over the summit to see what we see. But that's our plan. Do you ever ground truth that with the uh, depths we get from the ROV? I try to pay attention, like to see if it's close to what we what we estimate. But we often don't 
necessarily land on the pixel that we picked or sure good point okay. yeah and i do bring in the, like the depth but then you have to think about the altitude and all that stuff okay. so but yeah we do kind of just not really as a as a product or anything like yeah, that. yeah okay cool can you explain for the fans at home what the colors mean um oh, it's yeah. uh, it's just the color by depth and the bathymetry okay. so um this color map is turn on the color map range. Um, this color map is called Perula. It's one that is a default in MATLAB, but it's also quite a really nice color map. And Adam Sol, our lead scientist, uh, converted it into one that I can use in Flater Mouse. And so we've been using it on this expedition because it's just a much nicer color map. So last expedition, Trevor asked, if I wasn't going to use an awful rainbow color map, what would I use? This is one. This is a really nice one. It makes sense perceptually. Um, it's not a terrible rainbow. But I still use terrible rainbows to draw your attention to things like what we mapped <laughs> last night. So that's still nice and bright. So yeah, just color by depth. Um, sometimes we also do slope and color by slope. I don't know if I have any of those in here. Yeah, no slopes. Maybe next dive we'll have some slopes ready. Cool, that's my spiel. Let's go dive. Awesome. So Aaron, what did we do with the data after you've got it all cleaned up and, and ready to use? We, um, we do process it on ship. We will process it and have it completely ready to go and some standard products created by the time we hit port. Um, from there, uh, it goes, and I, we also do some, some QA, QC where we compare it against uh, the GMRT or global multi-resolution topography grids to make sure that we don't have any sound velocity issues or other types of issues in our data. And then we send it to R to R or rolling deck to repository. And that's a service that Lamont Darty provides mostly to UNOLS vessels, but we pay them for the service as well. They will get our data all into archive, um, do additional kind of just processing as far as metadata there. And then they set it up so that NOAA's NCEI um, kind of the, our US database for bathymetry data um, can fetch it from their archive. And it also, because Lamont is a part of the Seabed 2030, it's one of the regional data centers. Um, it also then helps to distribute this data to the digital bathymetry database um, that is hosting Jebco data and being used as the Seabed 2030 archive. So um, our grids get into a lot of different places pretty quickly because of that relationship. So we do our best, the, the QC we do allows the, the folks at Lamont to get it into the GMRT grid pretty quickly. Um, so they don't have to do a lot of additional processing in QC. And then yeah, make sure that it gets into all the, the CBED 2030 stuff and um, that we're contributing to this global attempt to map the sea floor by 2030. That's great.
Looks like we've got all the mapping fans this morning. Um, how does this data get used uh, to be helpful to further research? Well, we use it immediately as part of our dive, so it facilitates our ability to safely put the ROVs down and explore, um, first and foremost. And then, you know, if anybody else wants to come out here, I personally, I just want a map of our seafloor, so I don't need any additional reasons <laughs> other than feeling like we should have a better understanding of our planet and understanding processes on our planet. But as far as I'm concerned, bathymetry is the, the base map to understanding the geology, um, getting a better feel for habitat and potential habitat. I mean, it's literally the base map. It's literally the base map, and we don't have it. And I, I heard Megan talking about the fact that only 20% of the oceans is properly mapped. Um, the rest of it is estimated like this um, satellite altimetry. So we have indications of where features are, but we don't have the truth until we, we can go map it with a sonar. My goal is just to uh, make an illustrated map of the seafloor with the fresh data, so I'm waiting. How lame is it going to be in 2029 and a half when you have to do all the remaining spots that everyone knows is flat? But all the episode mapped? plans, I know. Yeah. Gosh. That can be pretty lame. It's going to be pretty lame. Okay. We, we fill those sometimes, but if, if I'm given a choice, I will see Mount Hop <laughs> with, the, with our transits because I can. Sure. We'll fill in the, the flat spots later. I'm not going to lie. I do get really annoyed when there's just like a little bitty like triangle left. Yes, it drives uh, me insane. That's why I, I practically begged Adam to <laughs> let us take the time to go do this because that was just so annoying. Yeah, and it's on the side of the seamount too. It's not even like a in the middle of nowhere area. Yeah, but it, I mean, as you as we all know, like things happen even when you're mapping. Like the weather comes up, you got to peel off. I've we've had to walk away from surveys and leave gaps that drive us crazy. It's just. You run out of time, the weather gets bad, or at that moment, the sonar decided it wasn't going to work anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so many so many things that happen. Uh, marine science is hard, and I'm pretty thrilled every time we manage to um, complete a mission successfully, because it's, it's very challenging. I've got a question about uh, whether we will fully map the seafloor within our lifetime. You want to talk about uh, seabed uh, 2030? With, I, I have doubts about 2030, but I think <laughs> within our lifetime, it doesn't seem unreasonable if we keep the pressure up that we're starting to get just based on seabed 2030. Even if we don't meet the goal, it's got people paying attention and, and trying to contribute and be part of that. So if we can keep up the momentum and with new technology coming online, we have more autonomous surface vehicles. Um, sail drone able to sail and map at the same time uh with all of this stuff coming online and becoming um more robust we just have more and more tools and i don't i don't think it's completely unreasonable someday at some point there's going to be just like this one little chip that nobody wants to go do it's just in the middle of nowhere we know it's flat land Nobody wants to go out there and <laughs> fill it in. Well, that's, I mean, that's really why it's so great that different vessels are willing to keep their sonars on because we all, on our way from one point to another, we pass these spaces that otherwise may never get passed, right? So it, I, I used to kind of like uh, frown on transit data because you're like, well, it should be properly mapped, but we are actually doing with folks like at, at Lamont doing the global multi-resolution topography model, they're actually making like a really reasonable base map. And a lot of it is transit data and just using their models and blending it, it's it's coming out pretty reasonably. So it's a cool effort. I mean, for how long have we just used uh, satellite data? So yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, at least, at least it's something. Like I can see there's bumps there. It'd just be really nice to, to see them for real. We, we so on the last expedition, we were mapping completely unmapped satellites. So it was a really fun game to see what the depth difference was going to be compared to the satellite altimetry. Um, and it, it can be hundreds of meters different or completely different shape. Um, it's quite 
It's a fun mapping game if you're into that. Yeah, I've played that game before. Uh, we chose a seamount that we wanted to dive on. Um, turns out it wasn't there. Oh. It was just an artifact oh, in that the was satellite harsh. data. That's, yeah, that's so we had to go somewhere completely different. When did you find out? Like after you were descending? Oh, no, no. We p did a pass over it to map oh, it. Oh, okay, okay. Um, And then it wasn't there, and the PI <laughs> was uh, pretty upset. <laughs> Thank goodness you hadn't, you know, deployed I, the ROV. I had insisted that, that we needed a backup plan, so we did already have lines planned. <laughs> Good call. Yeah, I'm hoping it wasn't a really isolated seamount. You didn't have to transit another couple of days or anything. Uh, it was just a few hours to the next location. Yeah, it's surprising. Uh, like two cruises ago when we were strictly mapping, we had a haul through the sanctuary and go hide on the other side because the weather was so bad and we found ourselves on the southern side kind of unexpectedly outside the bank outside the boundaries and we're like well might as well go map and i, I picked something on the seafloor and it was there was a feature there but it was you know three kilometers away from where we thought it was going to be so it's it's a good estimate but it's definitely not perfect But uh, yeah, I do find it really rewarding to, to fill in these gaps when we can. Are those ones up top there, just out of screen now? Are those all geodes? Are those uh, well, they're Northwest Hawaiian Islands, so some oh, of them, um, some oh, of them, I see. some of them have bumps that are above the surface. Um, if I others oh, are shoals or whatever. Yeah, so that's I mean that's fifty meters, so that's probably an atoll, right? That's probably land. Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah. But yeah, is there anything? Is this positive? That's 14 meters. So yeah, those are probably coral atolls and stuff. But yeah, like, you know, it's if they were down lower, but now they're still up. Cool. I think. Oh yeah, oh, I see the perspective now. Yeah, right. Yeah, so there's main Hawaiian yeah, islands. Right, right, and then right. as we trickle out, we've been all over this map already. It's so cool. We were up here. Right. Two or three, was it three expeditions ago? Then we were here last expedition, and now we're here. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to build a scene that has all of that in. So maybe by the end of this cruise, we'll have the the full picture of transit through all of oh, our exploration cool. out here. That's a great idea. It'll be, it'll be fun. This is what I do for fun. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting close. Never been closer. <laughs> Come on, you little rascal. Can I turn off your altimeter? Aaron, you can go back to high pack if you want. We're going to be getting ready for action soon. Action. I think that's as good an arbitrary spot as any. All right. Is it arbitrary enough? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Can oh. randomly move us over here. Oh, that's, that's appealing. <laughs> Let's just change everything. What a fun adventure. I'm going to screen capture this before we clear trails. Good call. What fun, not uh, PNG. <laughs> what fun, too. <laughs> what fun, too. The return of the what fun. <laughs> oh. Did I not do it right? question about how we time our dives. Does the dive clock start uh, when we start descending, or is it just the time that we are on the seafloor? I don't 
do we have an official for that? What's that? Sorry, I was um, my sonar. How we do our when, do we call the dive? We call the dive from launch, basically. Like that was that's the start of the dive. Uh, oh, the, the official start of is the dive. Is it? Yeah, is the clock start with the launch or when we're on bottom? I think of it as launch. It starts when Hercules is released from the crane. Okay. If you want an exact to the second time. Two on your sonar started. No. Oh, uh, okay. Cool. I hadn't looked up. I didn't know if we forgot the whole time or its purpose. Cool. Does it? It's Jess and Rennie. There's a little inner watch battle here over. I'll spy. I'll find out the details. <laughs>
Getting close to the bottom, so if you are out there watching us on the live stream, make sure to throw your questions for us in the chat box of uh, at Nautilus Live 